All right. So do you remember when I was introducing this unit and we had two functions? You know, one of them was the f of x equaling x squared minus 4. The other was g of x equaling x plus 2. Um, we'd been doing a whole bunch with piecewise, but now I want to move into combinations of functions. That's when you're using adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing to create a new function by just adding two functions, subtracting them, multiplying them, or dividing them. And so we looked at that using the example with the x squared minus 4 for one function and x plus 2 for the other. So if we're trying to create a new function by subtracting them, we're just going to take f of x and g of x and subtract them. And I did subtraction in my initial example because it's one of the ones people miss quite a bit because of the negative in front of that. You have to be sure to distribute the negative to subtract both the x and the 2. And then make sure you combine your like terms correctly and you've just created a new function. Okay. Well, I just used one of the operations. I could have used addition and done a similar thing or multiplication and done a similar thing. So I just wanted to look at one more here before we go to an illustration of that. Okay, so if we were to multiply the two, okay, the rule just says take f of x and multiply g of x. And that's how you create your new function. So f of x was x squared minus 4, and g of x was x plus 2. But this time, we're not adding, we're multiplying. And so we would wind up foiling that out. It would get x to the third plus 2x squared minus 4x minus 8. And that would be as simple as it gets. And that would be f times g of x. So we just created this new function. We created it by multiplying. Okay, so that's the thing I'm going to be focusing on right here. All right, now we don't usually have too much trouble with this. What's going on when you're doing arithmetic combinations is you're using, let me see if I can make that a little smaller, not that small. Okay, I need to get the whole thing to show. Okay, I'll do it about like that. Okay, so what, what's going on is you're trying to, I'm trying to in this illustration kind of show you what's happening here. And the whole idea of a function machine we used early on when we tried to get the idea of function notation. So the big machine is where I'm going to show you what, say, f plus g would be. Okay. So the name of that function is f plus g. So inside that machine is some process going on. And we're trying to see, well, what is the process that goes on? to define what it means when we're trying to do f plus g, f minus, and so on. So what I want you to, to think about is that you're going to have your input, your x, go into this big machine, and then this could be hidden from you, but what's going on is the x, the entire x, goes through the f function, and the entire x goes into the g function then something happens to it, something acts on it, and it winds up coming out from the, that machine. What would come out would be f of x. What would come out from the g machine would be g of x. And then if the operation I'm illustrating is addition, then it's after it comes out of the machine, you're going to add those two things together. okay? And then what gets spit out at the end of this machine would be what f plus g of x is. And so when you look at what's happening inside the machine, you can see why if we're doing f plus g of x, all we're going to do is take f of x, take g of x, and add those two things together. Now, I didn't want to have to draw four pictures because the picture um, for each of the other operations is exactly like that. Okay, And so like if you have subtraction, here, then that would become subtraction, that would become subtraction, that would become subtraction. If we're doing subtraction, we would just have a minus sign right there, wouldn't we? Okay, and then if we're doing multiplication, we would just put a multiplication sign here. Okay, everybody see that? Just put a multiplication sign. And then if it were division, okay, let me see, get a different color, how about yellow? Okay, if it were division, 
Sometimes we write it a little different, okay, but it's really just division, okay, that we would have happening on each of these, okay? All right, so when it is division, sometimes instead of writing it like that, we'll say we'll do f of x, f over g of x to show division. So remember that also means division. So it just means f of x divided by g of x like that, okay? All right, so that's the illustration for combinations. What I want to do is look at a worksheet and work through some combination problems with different representations, like sometimes a graph, sometimes a, a table, and sometimes an equation. And I want to focus to start with on question number three, where we have equations. Okay, so here I have one function, the square root of x plus 2, the other function is g of x equaling negative 1 over x, okay? And so I'm asking you on this to find f plus g of 0. So the first thing you want to think is, okay, well, that's f of 0, g of 0, and then add. So you want to just think through it like that and work out those two pieces. So if you do f of 0, wouldn't that just wind up putting a 0 there? That would be square root of 2. g of 0... Well, that would equal negative 1 over 0, and then you should think, uh-oh, that's undefined. So overall, this is undefined, the whole thing. You can't find f plus g of 0. So just what's going on is you made it through here okay. You wound up getting the square root of 2 when you got out of the f function. But g, you wound up getting stuck. You put a zero in and nothing came out. It got stopped in here. And so that means nothing's going to come out of the whole entire function. All right, let's try f minus g of negative 2. So that means we need f of negative 2 and we need g of negative 2. And then we're going to subtract those two things. Okay, so f of negative 2 would be the square root of 0. Okay, g of negative 2 and we're subtracting. So this one has a lot of negatives. This is that subtraction. So g of negative 2 would be negative 1 divided by negative 2. So I'm putting a negative 2 where the x is on those. And then I've got to simplify this. So square root of 0 is perfectly okay. It turns out to be 0. We have minus, but then we have minus 1 divided by minus 2, which is just a positive 1 half. And 0 minus 1 half would be negative one half. Kind of see how that works? Okay. All right, let's do g f of 2. That would be g of 2. There's no, no operation in between. It's multiplication. And f of 2, and then you're multiplying those two things. So g of 2 would be negative 1 half if I plug a 2 into the g function. When I plug 2 into the f function, I get, oops, let me erase that little piece right there. When I put 2 into the f function, I get square root of 4, and I'm going to multiply these two things. So negative 1 half times 2, negative 1 half times 2 turns out to be negative 1 when I'm finished. Okay. Now, f divided by g of 7, the order does matter. So the f of 7 is on top, and the g of 7 is on the bottom. All right, so f of 7 turns out to be square root of 9. g of 7 turns out to be the fraction negative 1 over 7. Okay, so the numerator simplifies to be 3, so we have 3 divided by negative 1 sevenths. All right, there's a, that's a complex fraction you have to simplify. You can use your calculator and just do 3 divided by negative 1 seventh, and it'll do that for you. Or you could... Um, rewrite this. Some people like to rewrite this. It makes sense to them to think of it as division. And then remember to keep, change, flip. And 3 times 7, well, I should say 3 times negative 7 would be negative 21. So there's lots of ways. You can just do 3 divided by negative 1 7 on your calculator. You can work it out by hand. Um, I even sometimes just when I'm doing complex fractions, just clear the little fraction. Just multiply the top and the bottom by 7, and I would get 21 over negative 1, and that would still give me the negative 21 there at the end. 
All right, I want to do one more um, type of thing. Down here, we're being asked to use the equations to find f plus g of x, like in general, okay? So that would just mean take f of x, take g of x, and then add them. f of x is the square root of x plus 2, and g of x is negative 1 over x. All right, now that's basically it. All I might do on something like this is clean it up a little bit instead of having two terms, get a common denominator and bring it all together into one term. And so that part of it would be this. Right now, this is over one. I need it to be an x. So I'm gonna multiply by an x on the top and bottom. All right, so that gives me, that gets me at that point, I'd have x times the square root of x plus 2, and then over here I have a negative 1, minus 1, and all of that would be over an x. So some textbooks, some people might want you to go ahead and, and get it all to be one term, okay, and consider that simplified, but I, I liked the look of the first one just fine. Um, all right, now the second one says to do f divided by g of x in general. So that would be f of x divided by g of x because of the order these are in. You'd replace the f of x with the square root of x plus two and the g of x with negative one over x. Then we're gonna do pretty much what we did up here. You're either gonna rewrite it as a division problem and do the keep change, flip, and x over negative 1 is just a negative x, and it would look better if you wrote that in front so nobody's confused about what's under the radical. And then that would be a nice, concise way of writing that. Okay? All right, now, two, something else you're being asked to do on that particular problem is determine the domain of each of these, okay? So I'm gonna go back um, or actually get a, I think I'll go back to that illustration because that's where I really wanna see it. So let's go back to the illustration we had earlier that was snipped and let's think about this, okay? So that we can think about the domain. So if we were dealing with um, this problem, let me do it in a different color since we're doing something new. Let me get to green. Okay, so the f of x was the square root of x plus 2 in that particular problem, and the g of x was negative 1 over x. All right, now I want you to really think about the illustration. That's the best way to really think about domain. Domain is really asking you, what are the x's you can plug in here at the top that are going to make it through both functions, so that you can add them, subtract them, multiply them, or divide them, and have something come out at the other end, okay? That's, that's what the domain really is. And so if you can't make it out of f or you can't make it out of g, okay, you need to exclude those x values, okay? The, the problem is not defined for those x values. So you see on the g that you better not have an x of zero, otherwise that's gonna be undefined. And then this one has the other trouble spot. It has the radical. So you know on this one, you need the x plus 2 to be bigger than or equal to 0. So you need the x to be greater than or equal to negative 2. Okay? And so you want to kind of put those two things together when you're thinking about the domain. All right, so let me clean up a little area down here. Let me get rid of this part. All right, and think about the green functions. I'm still doing the green ones. If I needed the domain for f plus g of x, okay, and I wanted the domain of that, what I would do is just consider these two pieces right here and think about it and put it together in interval notation. So it's saying that you need to be bigger than negative 2, okay, so you could be equal to it, but then you need to be bigger than negative 2, Okay, so you can come along like that. You can't be zero. And so that's really the picture of your domain. So the domain of that would be from negative infinity 
until I get, no, that's not true. I lied. The domain would be from negative two until I get to zero, jump over the zero and keep going. And the negative two has a bracket on it. And then we jump over the zero by using parentheses. That would be the answer to the domain for F plus G. But you see how it really depended on the domain of each piece? Because it, you've got to know, you got to be bigger than or equal to negative two to even get through the F function. And you better not be zero to get through the G function. But once you're through those, you just need to add them on that particular one. Okay. So that would be the domain on that one. And then the other one they asked us to do the domain of was F divided by G. Okay. F divided by G. So let's think about that a little bit. All right. So what you do is, um, what you can do, let me get back to that picture, there it is. If I'm trying to do the domain for f divided by g, I would still do this analysis right here. Okay, but now I'm thinking about f divided by g. So you might have an actual additional issue that you have to consider. Okay, so I'm thinking about the domain of f divided by g. So what I have to do is I have to, to get through F, I have to be bigger than or equal to negative two, and I can't be zero to get through G. And then I have to consider one more thing. Because this is, because this is introducing a denominator, you know, you got that G of X in the denominator, you also have to consider if there's anything else to exclude. So you have to look at, all right, is there anything that would cause, anything that would make g of x equal to zero? Because if anything makes the whole entire g of x equal to zero, I've got to exclude it. Okay, but this is a fraction that, that doesn't have a variable on top. It has a negative one on top. And there's no way to just turn that into a zero. There's no way to make that fraction be zero. So there's no additional issue on that one. So this would be the domain for it as well. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop this video and then I'm going to come back and look at combinations with different representations.